Good morning and welcome to Galapagos, why it's endlessly fascinating and why soon you must go or go again. I see that many of you from the chat have already been. Off we go to Galapagos and this iconic view of Pinnacle Rock from Bartolome Island. It's a land of stark beauty, Galapagos, a starkly beautiful place you can see from Fernandina over to Isabella with the people in the foreground for scale. Galapagos was called by Darwin a little world within itself, and little should be emphasized. The total land area is just barely bigger than our state of Delaware, and the largest island, called Isabella, is only 50 miles across at its widest point. Uh, you'll notice Isabella has the shape of a seahorse, you see? And uh, that picture I just showed you from Fernandina to Isabella was right there at the triangle. And it's easy to remember where you are in Galapagos because the equator passes through the nose of the seahorse. So that's one way to get organized. You can always tell how far you are from any place because the, the foot here is 50 miles across and you can always tell where you are relative to the equator by the nose of the seahorse. Each island is at least one volcano. And again, to take Isabella, you can see it's one, two, three, four, five, six, although the sixth one is incomplete, it's eroded away, so there are five complete volcanoes. Each island has at least one volcano, and Isabella has the record with five uh, plus the incomplete one, six. We're a thousand kilometers or 500 miles straight west of South America, and believe it or not, we're straight south of New Orleans. A lot of people think we're over by Miami or something, but no, we're straight south of New Orleans, about 2,000 miles. Galapagos is little, it's remote, it's volcanic and stark, so what's the big deal? What I'd like to say today is that five things today, five things, five features make Galapagos especially fascinating, including its record-selling biodiversity, but fascinating in a different way, also the powerful ongoing threats to that biodiversity, and thirdly, a number of reasons why soon I would say you should go. Soon, I say, because we're hoping to turn the corner on the COVID-19 pandemic, You'll be interested to know that all Galapagos over 18 have now been vaccinated. It's the first province in South America about which we can say that. And I'd like to say why even in the face of climate change and continuing human impact, there is a potential net benefit of your visit to Galapagos conservation and arguably to global sustainability. I realize it's controversial and I'll, what I'll do is spell out the reasons I feel this way. So five things make Galapagos especially fascinating. Let me review them at the start and at the finish. Home to Earth's most peculiar living organisms and not just a few species. Human impact while growing at alarming rates is still relatively new and relatively little. The islands enjoy a special place in the history of science with continuing and diverse contributions. Thanks to the previous three items, Galapagos collects unusually dedicated scientists, very active in the islands, but even so, there's a special sustainability urgency today. Without prompt action, and by more than just the scientists, much will be lost. Let me say just a few points about each of these in turn, starting with the first, home to the Earth's most peculiar living organisms and not just a few species. It's home, of course, to marine iguanas, wonderful organisms who dive through the surf and swim to the bottom to feed on crusted algae on the rocks below an underwater picture, or they wait for the tide to go down and they feed up close and personal on the crusted algae on the lava substrate, making every razor manufacturer jealous of how close the teeth are to the cutting uh, surface there. Yummy indeed as they swim back uh, to take a rest on shore. Consider their tails. These three species, the Tenosaur on the left, the land iguana in the middle, and the marine iguana on the right, all share the same ancestor, but look how the bottom half of that marine iguana tail is a propulsion machine. I mean, that just whips through the water and you can see the efficiency it must gain. They come back with their stomachs full of cold marine algae and you'll often see them basking in the sun. Uh, it's quite a sight to behold. Another example of the unique biodiversity, an albatross nesting on the equator. Come on, albatrosses. Albatrosses are from the roaring 40s and the furious 50s What's uh, of latitude. What's an albatross doing on the equator? And more so, it's the only albatross to build no nest. What's with that? No nest at all. Home to the world's only nocturnal seagull. 
You can see their beautiful, large red eyes ringed in red and a chick between them. A species of penguin on the equator, an Antarctic bird at zero degrees latitude. Well, not too surprising. Flamingos are there too, but wait a minute. Flamingos and penguins in the same little place. I can take you to a place called the Bainbridge Islands in Galapagos and show you in the same five minutes, flamingos and penguins adjacent to one another. Amazing. All over the world, cormorants are graceful flyers like this neotropic cormorant in the Amazon. But not here, not in Galapagos. The Galapagos flightless cormorant, look at it, it looks like a lead weight designed to sink to the bottom. And look at those tatty wings. Moreover, the islands are chock full of beautifully peculiar plants. To me, the most amazing of all are these, this wonderful tree. It's a daisy tree. A daisy tree? You say, Bill, what did you have for breakfast? You've got to be kidding. It is a tree, and it grows in a forest. Here's a picture of the forest. And for scale, here's a billboard along the road, and you can see just how big this forest is. They're 30, 40, 50 feet high, and way up in the canopy, you see a small composite flower head that tells you these are composite or what we now call Asteraceae. Here you can see the little flower, I'll blow it up here, and you can see it's a compound flower, it's a composite flower. And in this canopy lives another iconic species, the tool using woodpecker finch. Holding here a spiny branch of cat's claw, another tree that it's gonna insert into the knot in that tree, in the right direction so the spines are going to pull out a little insect grub that you can just make out at the tip of my arrow. Isn't that amazing? A tool using tree finch in the forest of daisy trees in the Galapagos. Amidst this diversity, some organisms varied by island as well. Says Darwin in his journal, it was confidently asserted that the giant tortoises coming from different islands in the archipelago were slightly different in form. The vice governor, Mr. Lawson, maintained that he could at once tell from which island anyone was brought by looking at the shape of its shell. Of course, we have the domed tortoises, such as the Santa Cruz tortoise, where the collar comes down to the back of the neck. But we also have the saddleback tortoises, like this San Cristobal tortoise, where the collar is turned way up, allowing greater movement of the neck. And there's an evolved association, no surprise. On islands with the saddlebacks, you also have these tree-shaped cacti, which are our primary food source in the dry lowland areas, suggesting an evolutionary arms race between the saddleback's ability to reach and the tree-shaped cactus's <laughs> evolution away from that reach. Amazing. Whereas on moist islands with dome tortoises, who are feeding low to the vegetation where there's lots to eat, you find only flat or recumbent cacti here scattered along the rocks. And on islands lacking tortoises altogether, you have cacti with bushy thorns. You can rub your hand over this, it's like a scrub brush, but you wouldn't want to rub your hand over the thorns on an island with tortoises. So let's make a short list of the unusual biota of Galapagos. There's the giant tortoises, the diverse prickly pear cacti, the forest of giant daisies, the tool using finches, there are two species of them, the penguin species on the equator, the world's only flightless cormorant, the only nocturnal seagull, the ocean foraging marine iguana, the world's only tropical albatross that builds no nest, three very colorful species of boobies, probably the best place in the world to see the boobies, owls that hunt by day, cooperatively breeding hawk, and folks, the list goes on. Why so many unusual species in such a small place like the size of Delaware? Darwin said he was astonished at the amount of creative force if such an expression may be used. This is before he wrote on the origin of species, displayed on these small, barren, and rocky islands. That's from his journal, uh, Voyage of the Beagle, uh, accounting his voyage. I call it the special re recipe and recognize three main ingredients, plates, pressure, and position. The plates are the moving tectonic plates especially Nazca and Cocos. The pressure is the pressure of molten magma that breaks through the plates, making a cluster of volcanic islands, a so-called hotspot that pushes up the islands from the ocean floor. And position, the hotspots at the equator, right on the equator as we've seen, where there's a unique convergence of currents of wind and water flowing around the volcanoes, even isolating the islands more completely. 
how they work together to generate all that diversity. Ah, that's one of the joys of being an author as I can now refer you to the book where that's done in detail because we can't do it here this morning. But back to the tortoises and their island by island variation. We know today that the vice governor was mostly right, except it's not just that each island has its own carapace. Each major intact volcano has its own species and its own carapace, which means that Isabella has five species. And one especially big volcano, Santa Cruz, has two species. So here you see them all arranged with their carapaces. Here you see the two species on Santa Cruz, the large island in the center. And sadly, three are extinct. They're on small islands, not too surprisingly, with the populations would be small. And the three extinctions in historical times bring us to topic number two, human impact. Human impact while growing at alarming rates is still relatively new and relatively little in Galapagos. Now it's true mariners stopped in Galapagos for centuries for instant provisions, especially for tortoises who were, you know, a, a, a good deal to take away. Buccaneers in the 1600s, whalers, tortoise and sea lion hunter, hunters in the 1700s, and their impact was huge on tortoises and they also released a few exotics like goats onto the islands. What a tragedy this is. Look at this 1901 photograph of tortoises slaughtered for their oil on Isabella Island. Prompting the population decline of Galapagos tortoises. Now we have credible estimates up to 336,000 tortoises before human arrival. I like to go with a more conservative estimate of 200,000, but you can just uh, run up that line in your imagination and the point will be the same. The number came down with buccaneers, it came down with whaling ships and hunters, and even the beagle took 48 home and ate them on the way. In the 1900s, settlers destroyed their habitats such that by 1970, there were only 8,000 to 13,000 remaining from 200,000 minimally down to let's say 10,000. Happily today, they're between 20 and 25,000 conservation efforts, the very diligent efforts of conservationists are having an impact, I'm happy to say. Well, the tortoise impact dates back before human settlement, but in 1832, Ecuador annexed the islands. They became a province of Ecuador, and Ecuador started the first enduring human settlements. It was one of the last archipelagos on earth to be settled. The government actually gave small tracts of land in the moist highlands to encourage the colonists to come in and to set up agriculture and do some fishing on the side. Life in Galapagos was isolated, rugged. Many gave it a go, cleared their land, tried for a while and gave up in frustration. It was a very difficult life, but their impact remained because what they cleared were the giant daisies. Here you can see them being carted away in a truck, cleared and used for timber, for lumber, to make houses, to make settlements, for all kinds of things. This was the major tree in the upland areas of the islands of Galapagos. You can see the pith down the middle of these logs. So great was the impact that if we look at Santa Cruz, that big volcanic island in the middle, and we refer to the work here of the botanist Albert Stewart, who is in the 1905-06 California Academy expedition to Galapagos, he saw this ring of these giant daisies on the island of Santa Cruz and documented what's now been estimated to be 9,600 hectares of them. About 100 years later, after all those colonists, we have only 100 hectares, about 1.1% of the total original, and those are there simply because of the protection of the national park. From a, a Google Earth perspective, it looks as though someone set down a giant lawnmower and took lawnmower swipes into the daisy forest, such is the tragedy of the daisy forest. By the 1950s, there was growing international concern over the tortoises, the daisies, and other things. And on the 100th anniversary of Darwin's On the Origin of Species, two impressive institutions were formed. The Galapagos National Park was set up, controlling 97% of the terrestrial surface area, leaving just 3% for human activity, a figure that remains to this date. So that's helped to maintain a small human impact. And the Charles Darwin Foundation chartered in Belgium was set up for international research support where, where they maintain the Charles Darwin Research Station in Galapagos with many top scientists of the area. Both institutions are still going strong. 
Here you can see in brown the Galapagos uh, National Park of Ecuador. You can see the areas that are in active human use in yellow. Surrounded by the Galapagos Marine Reserve in blue, it was created in 1998 and was then the second largest global marine reserve. Today, it's something like number 31 or lower because people are adding, uh, happy to say, marine reserves at a greater rate. Interesting, Galapagos is now actively reviewing a very important plan to expand the global marine reserve uh, out to its exclusive economic zone. To recap the first two points, 95% of the strange and wonderful biota are still there. Only 5% are lost, including those three tortoises we talked about. The author Annie Dillard put it well in her lovely book, Teaching a Stone to Talk. I recommend it for your summer reading if you haven't read it already. It says Annie, Galapagos is home to her Hieronymus Bosch assortment of windblown, stowaway, castaway, flotsam, and shipwrecked organisms. What a great description. Most exist nowhere else on earth. They have all been molested on the various islands on which they were cast into unique species. You come for the animals, she says. You come to see the curious shapes soft proteins can take to impress yourself with their reality. The animals are tame. They have not been persecuted and show no fear of man. You pass among them as though you were wind, spindrift, sunlight, or leaves. Sometimes the sea lion pups will even crawl into your lap and catch you by surprise. So human impact is still relatively new and relatively little. The islands enjoy a special place in the history of science with continuing diverse contributions. Those contributions, of course, began with the work of this gentleman, Charles Darwin, whom we think of as a wizened old scholar. But remember, he was 22 when the Beagle sailed and he was all of 26 for his observations in Galapagos. I love to tell today's undergraduates the work of a 20 something changed the way we think about our planet. So get out there and do it yourself. <laughs> Darwin was especially impressed by these birds, and no, that's not the finches. These are the mockingbirds. The finches Darwin found to be an inexplicable confusion. But the mockingbirds really surprised him because he found three recognizably distinct morphs. He was not an ornithologist. Darwin was a good naturalist and a careful observer, trained on beetles, in fact. But he noticed the differences. Look at the chest pattern here compared to here and so on. He noticed they were different by island. And where he'd been in South America, in Argentina and Chile, in all of Argentina, there's one morph. In all of Chile, there's another morph. They turn out to be different species, but it was gigantic areas. He gets to Galapagos and they differ by island. He returns to England in 1836 and asks for the help of John Gould, the leading ornithologist, to scrutinize his mockingbirds and tell him what he's got. Gould looked at the collection, which uh, the originals are shown here from the British Museum. And he concluded, my gosh, they weren't just morphs. They weren't just different forms. They were distinct species. Only one had three stripes on the wings, for example. And Gould said, look, in all the experience of ornithology, three stripes versus two, that's a species difference. And that was enough for Darwin to be persuaded. A month after meeting with Gould, Darwin took out his notebook B in March of 1837. And he wrote in this famous page, I think, and then sketched this diagram that one species modified through time for different ends, thus genera would be formed bearing relation to one another, different species bearing relation forming a genus. This, my friends, was the first tree of life diagram inspired by the mockingbirds of Galapagos. Well, Gould was right. We now know that the mockingbirds are confirmed by genetics to be four sister species, diverged from a common colonization an estimated 3.4 million years ago. The same with the famous Darwin finches, are all sister species sprung from a common source within the last million years, actually. Rapid evolutionary change. Here they are. 18 species are recognized, all from the common source shown up in the upper left. There's the ground finches, the tree finches that we've mentioned. The ground finches are full of lessons in history of science. Let me just review a few of them, largely from the work of Peter and Rosemary Grant and their colleagues. We now know that natural selection can have a measurable effect in a single year. Oh, everybody thought, including Darwin, that natural selection took a long time. You'd never see it. We now can see it year by year. Many recognizable morpho species 
of those Darwin finches are incomplete species. We recognize their difference, but they're capable of hybridizing. So it takes a long time for species to form and finches generally takes millions of years, five, maybe 10 for that reproductive isolation that keeps species distinct to evolve. But hybrid formation really throws us for a loop because it can also give rise to reproductive isolation in a single year. And there's a famous case of a cactus finch crossing with a medium ground finch producing a new line of birds called Big Bird. Everyone's watching with great anticipation because this might be the first vertebrate species to form while science watches, formed by a hybrid of two species. Other recent findings in evolution, how did tree finches evolve in a place, the highlands that had no trees? Evidence says they co-evolved with the giant daisies we've talked about. How did the daisies get there? They have big fruits and big seeds. They were probably carried by the finches and there was a co-evolutionary story. How do near flightless Galapagos rails remain one species with little variation across seven islands? They still fly between islands. That keeps them from being isolated and keeps their gene pools so closely similar on the different islands that we can hardly tell them apart. If there are three species of land iguanas, including the newly found pink species of iguana, why are marine iguanas still one species, albeit with 11 subspecies, but they all readily interbreed? Current evidence suggests they're more complex adaptations and include shrinking when food is scarce. When El Nino comes to Galapagos, the marine iguanas shrink like a concertina, like an accordion, slowly shrinking with the food supply and then regrowing again and shrinking again and growing again. And that kind of adaptation took longer to evolve than the less complex adaptations of the land iguanas. So that's just a few of the findings of evolution. Galapagos gives us advances in other fields, in conservation, when to control versus eradicate exotics, in marine biology, in volcanology and hotspots, in plate tectonics, in tourism, how to regulate, what fees to charge. With respect to El Nino and La Nina, Galapagos is ground zero for these phenomena. We've learned so much about climate and meteorology from Galapagos. So the islands enjoy a special place in the history of science with continuing diverse contributions. Thanks to the previous three, Galapagos collects unusually dedicated science scientists. Here we are in the top of the ground view looking at the Charles Darwin Research Station. And here we are in an aerial view taken by a drone. And there's a new vision there at the Darwin Station. Build local capacity. Start with young and well-trained staff. Isn't that wonderful to see the youthful exuberance of those faces? There are 124 or so staff scientists running 35 projects in 2019. Before the pandemic, there were 259 visitors among them. What a lively and important place this is. I can't name all the current projects, all 35 of them in conjunction with other NGOs, but let me just signal the reforestation of giant daisy forest. On Santa Cruz Island, I showed you how to been mowed down as it looked by agricultural activity, they're actively working to reforest. And then there's Project Floriana, bringing back the tortoises and the mockingbirds to that island. You may have heard of the rewilding fund given by Leonardo DiCaprio to help Project Floriana, a noteworthy uh, example of a current CDRS project with the National Park. And there's a last big one, the goal is to make Galapagos a model for global sustainability, a project I heartily endorse. So thanks to these projects, Galapagos collects unusually dedicated scientists, but even so, there's a special sustainability urgency today. Without prompt action, all will be lost, a lot will be lost. Today, Galapagos is home to more than 35,000 people. Look at the impact we're having in the town of Puerto Ayora. There's the impact of all our commerce, our trade, our travel. There's the impact of agriculture, our pets on four islands. There are two jet ports with up to 10 commercial round trip flights per day, over 270,000 visitors in 2019. Of course, that's changed with the pandemic. We've introduced 20 species of mammals, some of which eat iguanas of all kinds, and goats, which strip the vegetation, as you can see here on San Cristobal. Here are a couple of my colleagues on the side of this 
uh, volcanic cone to show you the extent of the goat damage. That should be covered in vegetation. We have introduced terrestrial mammals on all of the islands. Look at their pictures here, their cartoon representation for each island, except for two islands, Henovesa to the north and Fernandina to the west, where we have not introduced mammals. And now Española in the south has been cleared of mammals. Why with all this do I encourage you to go? I've carefully weighed the pros and cons and the genuine educational ecotourism ranks high as a leading sustainable development, a sustainable revenue stream for Galapagos. I think this is the best bet for Galapagos, achieving sustainability with a reliable revenue stream is genuine educational ecotourism. But tourism's gotta be different in the future than it was in the past. Before a law in 1998, tourism was attracted by the showcase biota that I've showed you and it prompted economic activity in the islands, which prompted a lot of immigration. The immigration came and brought introduced organisms, caused a modification of habitat and transportation reduced the isolation. So these had a negative impact on the conditions, the absence of terrestrial mammals, the harsh conditions and the isolation that were responsible for giving Galapagos the showcase biota in the first place. So we had a big feedback loop of negative impact on what drew people to the islands. There's a new vision going forward and it, it works to control the immigration, to put conservation funding as the main outcome. So the showcase biota attract tourism, attract economic activity and generate conservation funding through philanthropy and direct assessments that will then contribute in a positive way to the factors that contribute to the maintenance of the showcase biota of Galapagos. Now it's easy to say. Let me give you some important background information you need to know. The National Park receives 50% of the entrance fees from visitors and that in 2019 was roughly $19 million. Imagine that you run a park or any business where you have $19 million to count on because you've got 50% of a big group of people coming in, 50% of their fees and then the pandemic hits, you lose $19 million revenue overnight. Tough. Local municipalities receive 25% and the governing council received 10% of the entrance fees. The Darwin Station received zero from the entrance fees and also zero from the Ecuadorian government. It was set up as an international organization chartered in Belgium and it's supposed to raise its own funding. So it's not dependent and that gives it a lot of independence, which is good but how are they gonna fund themselves with the pandemic? The entrance fees were set by law at $100 per adult foreigner and have not changed since 1998, making the fee for a seven day trip one of the lowest of all major uh, tourism attractions. Machu Picchu, Mount Kilimanjaro, look at the list of seven day prices over here on the right and look at Galapagos National Park. It'll cost you $100 only to stay a week in Galapagos, that's all that they will get to sustain the park from your visit. What's kept it going in the face of all these years of the same $100 fee is the growth in tourism. And you can see it's a staggering rate of growth, uh, including foreigners and very recently a sharp upturn in national tourists. So why do I encourage you to visit? To help make tourism into that positive loop. Galapagos needs responsible tourism to help fuel the conservation efforts to keep the revenue stream Especially now, if the revenue remains low, Galapagos will be in serious trouble because there'll be no revenue to run the conservation programs. If it's been an open access global commons, we've got to help pay the price for putting it back on track. But tourism and the immigration it induced in the past much, must be limited. How to do this fairly is a big question of the day. Build the revenue and at the same time reduce the numbers. That means higher fees, and more philanthropy from those who come. There are special needs now, as summarized by a Galapagos relief fund stimulated by COVID. As they say, tourism is a backbone of the Galapagos economy. When COVID-19 halted travel to the Galapagos in March, 2020, virtually overnight, it created immediate profound hardships for families, businesses, the community at large. With this economic devastation comes a threat to the ecosystems and wildlife of this iconic World Heritage Site. The fund supports community-based loans, ensuring families' basic needs are met, kids can stay in, stay in school, and sustainable businesses can survive. 
grow and hopefully thrive. You can see here what the impact was. This shows the daily arrivals. And suddenly in March of, of 2020, boom, it goes to zero and you can see the slow rebound. So how can you most help? Read up before you go and or take a class to make the most of the trip. Go with family or friends who also prioritize education and share the experience. Build your visit around a boat-based trip that is Smart Voyager certified. This is a company that certifies ships for having an environmental and social impact that's favorable to sustainability. This is their logo. But make it a hybrid. Stay over some time in town. Contribute to local livelihoods and enjoy the cultural experience of the place. Consider ways you might help by volunteering with some of your ideas, perhaps your technological expertise and or financial support. And on return, most important of all, share the experience, spread the word that Galapagos is deserving of our support. Stanford has a good record in Galapagos. The travel study trips do the right things. They prioritize education. They take only top-notch local naturalists to lead us. They hire certified ships with Smart Voyager. They use local providers with active philanthropic programs. Stanford has a good reputation, but there's always room for improvement. As we all know, we could explicitly offer carbon offsets or build them in. Encourage people to do that. Plan hybrid trips, spend some days in and near town, add a seminar. Now that we're all used to Zoom, add a seminar before travel to help frame the trip and help give people an idea of what to look for. Of course, there are other things you can do. You can support the Darwin Foundation, because as I've mentioned, they depend on private uh, funding for all of their efforts. Or you can support the Galapagos Conservancy, the leading NGO in the United States doing work with the Charles Darwin Foundation and the National Park. To conclude, the keys to sustainability in Galapagos are one, immediately limit the numbers of tourists and maintain and strengthen the limits on immigration. Find ways to increase the entrance fees and philanthropy by tourists and the local providers, the boat companies and so on. Improve the educational experience of visitors so they really appreciate all that they're seeing make tourism a force for sustainability. So today we've discussed why we find Galapagos so endlessly fa fascinating, excuse me, how its unique biodiversity remains threatened today, and why with all the signs of climate change and human impact, I encourage you to go, to go in a thoughtful way. Let me give you three last points. Go, go wisely, use the hybrid model, use certified providers. Offset your carbon, but go. Galapagos needs thoughtful, caring visitors more than ever. This is their hope. It's not just me saying this. Tweet Roy, one of the great photographers of Galapagos, gave a talk this last weekend in which she makes this very point. We need the sustainable revenue of thoughtful, caring, education-focused tourists. Come back and spread the word. Explain to others why Galapagos warrants our active support. For example, tell your friends about two of the rarest birds on the planet with fewer than 2,000 individuals each. The cormorant, the penguin, and their struggles with food supply during El Nino when their numbers can fall as low as five to 600. And show them good evidence for the increasing El Ninos across time, which abounds. You can find some of this in the book. And Darwin would say, give your friends some time. He says, I remember too well how many long years my own conversion to believe evolution, to accept evolution as the story of life, it took him a long time. Let me leave you friends with this final thought. Is Galapagos a microcosm of the whole deal? We think of it as a small place with unusual organisms, but if you step back, the earth is a small place with unusual organisms. The lessons we may learn in Galapagos may well be crucial to the future of life on Earth. I thank you for your attention today, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Bill. Um, I'm, I'm sure like alums, we're all anxious to get to the Galapagos as soon as we can. Um, I'm gonna jump right into alumni questions. Um, Scott's wondering about the latest efforts to protect migratory endangered sharks between the Galapagos and Costa Rica. Are there global efforts to prevent overfishing on those routes? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. I mentioned in passing a new effort to expand the Galapagos uh, Marine Protected Area out to the, um, to the economic uh, zone around Galapagos. And one of the main motivations is to protect the swimway of the sharks. Now the shark swimway is, is, is 
just coming into clear focus. The sharks are clever. You see, the, the, the hot spot leaves a trail on the ocean floor. It leaves a trail of seamounts, old volcanoes on the ocean floor. The sharks use that to steer their course as they head up to an offshore area for feeding off Costa Rica. So you can follow the Cocos Ridge of seamounts in that direction, or you can follow the Carnegie Ridge of seamounts because they're two plates that were affected by the volcanic activity of Galapagos. And what's totally fascinating is to see how the sharks you know, actually navigate using those visual guides among others. They cover great distances. And yes, indeed, I hope this new plan to expand the Galapagos Marine Reserve. There are many, many fishers just outside the current marine reserve, taking shark fins, harvesting sharks, taking hammerheads, all kinds of terrible things. They monitor them when they can from Galapagos and it looks like a pearl necklace around the outside of the, of the Galapagos Marine Reserve. All the ships lined up right at the edges because they know they're protected inside and the densities are therefore high. So I'm very hopeful that there will be um, even a larger expansion. Right now, the swimway is protected by an agreement with Costa Rica, um, Ecuador, and, and Colombia, and I think Panama as well. So there'll be um, more to say about that in, in the years ahead. You mentioned some of the financial impacts from the COVID pandemic. Um, are there any other ways the pandemic has affected the economy and conservation efforts and perhaps even um, impacts because of lack of human absence? Has that changed the biodiversity during this time? Well, what's interesting is, you know, as you might guess, um, marine iguanas have come up onto the city streets. The Galapagos sea lions are making themselves comfortable on everybody's dock. <laughs> they did that anyway. <laughs> There's just more of them. A lot of the wildlife is actually experiencing a kind of release from the presence of human activity. Now, that said, our activity is so carefully regulated in Galapagos by the National Park. They have a program called Simavis, which spreads all of us visitors around the visiting sites of Galapagos in a way that we have minimal impact. There are never more than 90 or 95 people, including guides in the same place at the same time, for example, and we're spread out across more than 100 visitor sites. So. Yes, there's been some um, you know, freedom on the part of the organisms, but not as much as, you know, you see these pictures of sheep coming into towns in Ireland. Or <laughs> it, it's not been quite like that in Galapagos because the organisms really had quite a bit of, of, uh, of, of, of leeway all along. Our impact has been very mild. The economic impact has been very serious, however, um, and it threatens the ongoing conservation efforts. A lot of the, for example, every year they go out and they do a survey, a, a, a count, a census of cormorants and penguins. Well, that takes a lot of resources. It takes time, it takes effort, there's data analysis, there's um, a geographic uh, information system of work to be done. And without, if you lose suddenly $19 million from your conservation budget, it's going to have an impact on efforts like that. So uh, that's one of the reasons I'm a big proponent of a cautious, thoughtful rebound of, of, uh, of carrying tourists to Galapagos. I really think it's the most sustainable revenue stream for the whole archipelago. Um, Brad just had a comment that it's great to see you haven't lost a bit of enthusiasm in your teaching, and I echo that. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more about how conservation funding specifically switches the loop to positive feedback? Conservation funding, the, the weak point in that feedback loop was that the economic activity of the islands triggered migration, immigration to the islands. It was no secret in Ecuador that you could have a higher per capita wage in Galapagos than you would even with a decent job in the Altiplano up in the Andes. So if your family moved to Galapagos, you would enjoy a, a, an economic improvement. That was no secret. And so really people came in good numbers across the years out to Galapagos looking for that improvement. And as tourism grew, uh, shops were set up and people ran, you know, t-shirt shops and restaurants and that sort of thing. So immigration uh, absorbed a lot of the, uh, contributed to a lot of the economic activity, but it was the immigrants more than tourism. It's not tourists are carrying out cats and dogs, it's that the immigrants brought house pets. 
and they brought house plants. You'll see so many in the Galapagos. It's one of these places in the world where you can see an endemic lantana and you can see the lantana that people have brought. The endemic one, little white flowers. The one that we all know so well, the beautiful multicolored orange and red lantana, they grow side by side because it's escaped now from the gardens of people who brought it in. So what I'm saying is that the immigration had a really strong negative impact. It, it eroded the, um, the, the attractive biota, which were the reason people wanted to go to Galapagos in the first place to see these unusual life forms which abound. If we can take that economic activity now, put a cap on the migration, so there's no net additional migration to the islands, then the economic activity sustained by tourism can contribute to the caring of the harsh environmental conditions, the lack of mammals, clearing the mammals and so on, and will actually have a positive feedback loop rather than a negative feedback loop. This is not a pipe dream. We've already seen how it happens. Some companies that I won't name because I don't want to be seen as advertising for them have already given millions of dollars in philanthropic contributions derived from tourism revenue on board their ships to help with the conservation efforts, to help eliminate goats from islands, to bring back the tortoises in the breeding projects and so on. So that's a very realistic, uh, it, it's not a make-believe, it's a realistic prospect for changing the the, the terrible impact that immigration had into a positive impact in terms of philanthropic funding. And would you say that Ecuador is considered a leader in global conservation efforts um, on land-based natural areas outside of the Galapagos? Outside of the Galapagos, the record's a little more spotty, um, but uh, that's going to be true uh, anywhere. Galapagos has always been sort of the, you know, the flagship of the, Galap of the Ecuadorian National Park system. And a lot of lessons learned in Galapagos have been valuable throughout the world, um, you know, especially with respect to controlling goats, for example, or pigs. They learned some lessons that have been used other places. They drew on lessons from other places, but they also learned some. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say that Galapagos is still a good example. Now, you know, everything's relative, so it's not perfect. <laughs> You go there and you might still see goats. I can take you to a place where you've got a 50, 50 or more chance of seeing a goat just during a 15 minute visit. That's scary to me, um, but yet they're still working and they're working hard. And um, the lessons that are being learned in Galapagos are relevant to controlling those animals, the places, the exotics and plants and animals. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and there were a couple of questions about that, like you that you mentioned exotics need to be eliminated. Are they exotics that are, are all the exotics not native to the Galapagos? Um, are there other invasive species or organisms that should not be there? And what, what's happening to the feral goats and other pests? It was a wonderful project undertaken in the period of 2000 to 2006 or so called Project uh, Isabella. And it was the largest effort on planet Earth at that time to eradicate goats from major uh, islands of Galapagos. They were successful in eliminating goats, for example, from Santiago Island and also from Isabella. It was a huge effort and included millions of dollars of international efforts, um, helicopter flights and sharpshooters and all kinds of effort. And it was very successful. Um, that's an example of an exotic or an alien organism that's introduced that was really invasive, very aggressive, just spreading as quick, you know how goats are, they can eat any old thing and they just love to reproduce and the next thing you know, your volcano is covered with goats. It really scared us all. And you'll see pictures, there's a couple in my book, for example, where there are more goats in a picture than there are tortoises, even though the tortoises aggregate for you. Um, the tortoise, the, the, the goat problem was really serious, but so is the problem of blackberries today. Blackberries have been introduced to Galapagos. Very few things can eat their way through those spines. It's again, it's another alien exotic species that's invasive. It just grows and grows. There's a nice story though, quinine was introduced. Someone thought that quinine, you know, we use it for tonic water and we also use it for malarial, anti-malarial medication. Someone thought if you put quinine trees in Galapagos, you'd have a great place because there are so few tree species other than those beautiful giant daisies. You could grow quinine without competition and have lots of quinine harvest. 
So they brought in quinine trees and they just took off. They grow from sucker sprouts, they grow from seed, and they just, oh, it was the biggest plague you ever saw when all of a sudden they started dying off. A fungal disease, it's believed, came out and has, because the quinine got to such great densities as an introduced species, another introduced species was attacking and controlling the quinine. So there, sometimes there are happy stories, not always, <laughs> but that's one case of a, a, an invasive exotic species that was controlled uh, in due course by natural process. There's a, a couple of questions about visiting. Um, do you have a perspective on Galapagos tours that base tourists on one island and do different day trip trips to different sites each day versus ship-based tours? And, and are there off-peak or on-peak times to visit? Yes, um, it's no secret. You can look at the graph I showed you that had the daily arrivals and you can see when the low period is. One of the reasons I love to take uh, Stanford classes in September is that's the lowest month of the year across many, many years. Uh, that's because uh, Europe and North America go back to school. So if you can go in September, that's a really good time. Avoid North American holidays, avoid the New Year's period, uh, the winter holidays, that's a difficult time. And generally speaking, our summers in the Northern Hemisphere are also a good time, if you can, to avoid. It's not always possible. And so any time to go to Galapagos is a good time to go. Um, uh, what was the first part of the question? It was about um, um, visiting kind of one island versus, versus oh, yeah. all of yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> those are called land-based or uh, day tripping. And the reason I plug the hybrid model is because uh, the day trips take you to places uh, very close to the towns. You have to zoom out in a speedboat and zoom back in the same day. So you can only go a max a couple of hours if you're gonna have any experience in the place you're going at all. And inevitably it's gonna be a shortened experience. It won't be as much of an in-depth look as it would be if you went on a ship that stayed overnight and allowed you to spend four hours on that island, for example, four or five hours. Uh, or allowed you to go twice to the same island in the same day. So I'm a big believer in both. The, what, the benefit of the day trips or the land-based tourism is that it helps small and medium entrepreneurs. It helps the small family-run business. You jump on a speedboat the family owns, you come back and eat in the restaurant, you stay overnight in the hotel and that sort of thing. The reason I like the hybrid models, because then you're on one of the ships that takes you out to the really far areas. To go to Henevesa, you can't go on a day trip. To go to Fernandina, the two islands that have no introduced vertebrates, you have to go on an overnight or a, a boat that takes several days to get there. So uh, I'm a big believer that we can do both, that we can do those specialized trips to distance and that we can help the small and medium entrepreneurs of Galapagos contribute to local livelihoods. Uh, I'm, I'm all for doing a mix and that's why I call it the hybrid. And do you have any recommended organizations for volunteering short or long-term in the Galapagos? Well, I would always start with the Charles Darwin Foundation. They love people to come work in the library, for example. Oh, they have the best library about Galapagos that you can imagine. It's a marvelous facility. And they always need help. Um, it may be digitizing, it may be photocopying, all kinds of maintenance. Um, and there's just no limit to the wonderful resources that the, that library can share with the world. There are many other ways to volunteer. They sometimes need hands pulling up um, Blackberry. They need hands sometimes um, you know, picking up trash on the beaches. You know, the currents are such that the currents sweep in from South America, which means that the plastic carried by the currents from South America arrives at Galapagos and it hits those volcanoes and the current drops the plastic all on the east side of Galapagos. Microplastics and mesoplastics, all kinds of plastics accumulate on the, accumulate on the beaches of Eastern Galapagos. And, you know, it, it would be a good thing for the whole world um, for us to volunteer, to go and help pick up uh, on those beaches. They do have cleanup days and they're organized uh, ways to do that. Um, but I would always uh, 
contact first the Charles Darwin Foundation, the Charles Darwin Research Station. You can also contact the Galapagos Conservancy, especially if you're not free to travel. The Galapagos Conservancy is based in uh, Virginia and they often can accommodate um, uh, volunteers there working on projects uh, of theirs, even at a distance from Galapagos. Another wonderful place to consider is the, the consortium of the uh, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill with the University of San Francisco of Quito in Ecuador. They run a research station on the island of San Cristobal and they often, um, they take students and they often uh, incorporate um, interns and so on into their research programs there. So there are several places one can look at with real legitimate volunteering um, need. Thank you, we're so used to working remotely. So it's nice you shared some volunteer remote opportunities also from the Galapagos. Um, can you share a, a quick overview on how scientists saw evidence of evolutionary changes over one year? Many of us yes. think that that takes so much more time. Isn't that interesting? Um, so what Peter and Rosemary Grant did was they arrived in the 70s and immediately started measuring the beaks of all those finches. <laughs> this is a wonderful book. Let me just say that at the outset. Jonathan Weiner's Pulitzer Prize winning Beak of the Finch, it's called, published in 95. You can maybe find some published in 94 in hardback, whatever, but 94, 95 called The Beak of the Finch. It tells that full story better than I can ever tell it. But in short, the Grants arrived and started measuring the beaks of all the finches. Oh, good morning, Margaret. They didn't have personal names for them necessarily, but they recognized every finch and they had, they knew the size of its beak. There were 1,200, 1,400 finches in the year 76. A drought hit in 77. At the end of 77, there were 200 of these ground finches left. From 1,200 to 200, 1,000 had died. And the ones that survived had an average beak depth that was significantly measurably greater than the population that started into the drought. They showed that the difference was heritable, that the offspring of those surviving finches with the big beaks went on to have a generation of descendant finches with bigger beaks. And so the result was that the gene pool was shaped by the food scarcity induced by the drought in a single year that meant that if you had a bigger beak, you could bite open a little bigger seed and survive the drought in a way that the finches with the smaller beaks couldn't. Now you say, whoa, we're talking about millimeters of difference. Well, it's several millimeters of difference, but we learned from the Grant's work, the importance of small differences, that they make the difference between life and death and the data show that very clearly. And the result was we had natural selection in a single year caused by a drought and the food shortage on the island where they were. Very interesting. Uh, the Beak of the Finch is the book to read if you want to really get the lowdown. I have really made a simple, uh, an interesting story very simple today. <laughs> and, and what makes for the difference between species versus subspecies versus hybrid formations? Oh, I'm so glad. This is one of those questions, you know, that takes a seminar class about three hours to sort out. Um, so let me just say that at the start. What we've always understood is that species are separate when they have a reproductive barrier, when they cannot successfully interbreed. What we're seeing in Galapagos is that a lot of the species, the small, medium, and large ground finch, or the small, medium, and large tree finch, we're seeing that they're morphologically distinct. We can identify them. They're ecologically distinct. They eat different foods. They behave differently, but they get together and they hybridize. We all thought they were different species, but if they're hybridizing, if they're producing fertile offspring, indeed, sometimes there's hybrid vigor that in fact, the hybrids have a higher reproductive success than the parents did. Well, that's really counter to the traditional theory that says when they're really separate species, they should have a reproductive incompatibility. So what we now realize is that these morpho species, the beaks that we recognize as being different, small, medium, and large for the ground finches, for example. We recognize that those differences are their incipient species. They're species in the process of forming and that it takes millions of years for that to happen. Well, we come along now and start measuring. We also start sharing our 
you know, leftover uh, meals on outdoor patios and here come the finches and they mix and mingle. And, you know, there's just a lot of hybridization going on, which can definitely share genes across those lines and contribute to the frequencies of hybridization. One of the things we should be uh, watchful of and thoughtful about is not increasing the rates of hybrid formation. The natural rate of hybrid formation is, you know, that, that, that's inevitable, that's gonna take place. But with our grains of rice, we may be encouraging more mixing of these uh, hybrids, uh, more mixing of these uh, incomplete species and encouraging hybrid formation. So I'm just saying, um, yeah, uh, it's still a tricky business. We recognize as um, subspecies, those variants that are geographically specific that are recognizably different. So the marine iguanas in the north are dark and the ones in the south are bright red sometimes. We know those are differences, they're heritable differences and so on. But you bring them together and they hybridize, but they're recognizably different. They're dark in the north and they're bright red in the south. I think it has a lot to do with the sharks and shark predation on the sharks are drenched up there in the north in that colder water area, and then they are down in the south. But that's just Bill's homespun theory, so don't quote me on that one. <laughs> but there are differences, recognizable physical differences between the subspecies of marine iguanas, but they all interbreed, so it's one species. We've got time for one last question, and I'm, I'm going to cheat and ask you to. Um, Billy's dad raved about blue-footed boobies decades ago. Are they still around? And also, uh, many alums would love to know what first got you interested in the Galapagos? Wow. I have to admit, um, I found recently in my files the first proposal I wrote to go to Galapagos. I was a graduate student, still at the University of Michigan before I was hired at Stanford. The year was 1975, and I had read a very interesting article in one of those published anthologies about the Galapagos about how maybe there was a mutualism between tortoises and cacti. And I was all excited about the idea of mutualism. I was studying with some professors at the University of Michigan who'd studied mutualism between plants and animals. And I thought, whoa, what a great idea. And I get to go to Galapagos. I mean, is there a, I was a biology major at Stanford. I went on to be a human biology professor. I, got a degree in zoology and then a degree in evolutionary biology at Michigan. Is there a biologist alive who wouldn't love to go to Galapagos? So I wrote a proposal uh, to the expedition that was going in 75. They accepted me and they even gave me some funding. And I was so excited to go when all of a sudden a health issue befell the organizer. It was initially postponed and then it was canceled because the health issue dragged on a while. I was terribly disappointed. But by this point, I'd learned so much about Galapagos. I was so excited when I came to Stanford, I just started to talk about the Galapagos organisms. Not that I'd been there in person yet, but that I had learned about, seen videos about and that sort of thing. And um, so I began teaching about Galapagos. And then when the opportunity came, believe it or not, thank you, Stanford Alumni Association. They were my entree to Galapagos. I you know, put it off from graduate school to getting a job, starting a family and all those things. And then all of a sudden I was invited by the Alumni Association to go to Galapagos on, uh, as faculty leader of a trip to a place I'd never been before. That was brave of them, but I was such a Galapagos fanatic as you can probably sense that I loved the experience and I loved being there in, in person. And one more little anecdote that's fun. As a child, I grew sunflowers. And I took pride. I won a blue ribbon at the county fair because on a hint from a neighbor, I planted my sunflower seeds surrounded by used eggshells. And that caused the sunflowers to grow to more than two meters. I was a young lad, wasn't anywhere close to two meters tall. And I looked up at my sunflowers and I took them to the I took them to the county fair and I won a blue ribbon. I arrived in Galapagos and see these related giant daisies 50 feet in the air. <laughs> I was really set up by my early experiences in life, even before the proposal to study tortoises. I was set up by my experience raising sunflowers to appreciate what Galapagos had to offer. So, you know, which of those was more influential? Was it my sunflower experience? Was it the tortoise proposal? Actually, what really got me to go up was the Alumni Association, and I've been very grateful for that opportunity ever since. I, I never knew that before. And are, are the blue-footed boobies still there? 
oh my gosh, the blue footed boobies are there. Now they've had some bad years. Every time there's an El Nino, I'll let you in on Bill's theory. Bill's theory is that the blue footed booby evolved those blue feet in Galapagos. It's counter to a lot of other people's theories. So take it with a grain of salt today, folks. But remember, you heard it here first, because it may be true. <laughs> because in Galapagos, unlike the coast of South America, there are only sardines. The anchovies that occasionally come out to Galapagos from the coast of South America hit those currents and their eggs are shuffled away off to the mid ocean somewhere where they perish. The sardines are careful about their eggs. And the result is when a booby ancestor came to Galapagos, they found lots of sardines. Sardines are rich in the blue pigment or the blue pigment uh, predecessor that colors the blue footed booby. So a booby with let's say gray feet flies in and starts eating sardines and there's very little else. There aren't those anchovies that there are on the coast of South America. So it's not a mix of colors. And you can see how a, one that does very well at getting sardines would have a little color in its feet and that would be attractive to the mates uh, as natural selection works because there would be a reproductive advantage to both the mate and the, the male and the female. And the result is you'd get evolution for foot coloring as a measure of success in hunting sardines. So I think it's a unique setup. And why are the sardines so good and successful? It's because of that convergence of currents that around the Galapagos that create a churn rich in nutrients that feed the sardines, that feed the boobies. And so it's a lovely place. Now, I may be wrong. The boobies may have evolved in Mexico and flown down to Galapagos, but I think the boobies evolved in Galapagos. And when El Nino came, they have the, many of them leave and they fly up to Mexico where the water may be not as warm and there may be more sardines for them to feed on. Um, they're there, they're doing well most years. They went through some bottleneck periods when the sardines got scarce with El Nino. Uh, there's not a lot that can thrive during El Nino in the water, it gets so warm. Um, but the blue footed boobies are there and um, I'm delighted to say you can see them doing their mating dance to this day, and it really is something you ought to see in your lifetime. Bill, thanks again for taking us on a my trip pleasure. to the Galapagos. And Thank you all today. for coming today. My goodness, what a treat to have so many people interested in Galapagos.